Welcome to another edition of COVID Rehab and Recovery Series. My name is Noah Greenspan. A um, lot to cover today. And it's kind of the same stuff that we've all been covering in a different way, which is exactly what every week is like when you're dealing with COVID. So it's like same, different stuff, same, different week. Um, but again, I think that something that is really crucial over and over and over again is to really understand this autonomic dysfunction. Um, because I think that that is something that is really significantly um, affecting many, many, many people. Um, in the majority of patients that I've seen, and we currently have um, 300 uh, post COVID patients on boot camp, and I've personally seen about 100 patients myself in consultation. Um, and I could tell you that in almost none of the cases has it been a cardiovascular limitation or a respiratory limitation or a gastrointestinal limitation um, or a neurologic limitation in the traditional sense that we think of neuro. Um, so if there's no cardiac, no pulmonary, no GI, and no classic neuro, then we have to assume, and not assume, it's it's it's. We don't have to assume anything, but the gut feeling and the kind of thinking of people at this moment is that it's it's dysfunction of the autonomic nervous system. So the thing about that is it is a tough thing to train. Okay, it's a tough thing to train. It's a tough thing to make progress in. It's a tough thing to be consistent with. And so before we go on, there's one point that I think is really important to understand, which is that do not expect a straight uphill climb, okay? If you are sitting and waiting for that line to start moving you up the ski lift to get to the top of the mountain, it's not coming. And I don't say that to discourage you. I say that to let you know that it is not to your advantage to wait for that to happen, okay? Because it's like you're saying, when am I gonna do this? 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 the emotional stress and anxiety related to that can be just as damaging to you as any physical stress. So that's the second point, okay? The sec so the first point is don't wait. The, se the second point is emotional can equal physical. So when we talk about dysfunction of the autonomic nervous system, the autonomic nervous system is confusing, it's tricky, uh, it's got a mind of its own, sometimes many different minds, okay? It may feel like a, you know, like you're, you're dealing with a split personality, autonomic nervous system. And again, the reason I tell you this is not to discourage you. My overall gut feeling is that everybody's going to get better over time, okay? That's my gut feeling. I don't have a gut feeling that it's going to be fast, and I don't have a gut feeling that it's going to be straight and or smooth. It will be for some of you. Okay, it won't be for others. So there are going to be long haulers and there are going to be longer haulers. Um, but the key is I want to provide you with the, the correct soil and the right seeds and the right fertilizer to maximize growth. So if we overwater, that's just as bad as underwater. If we over fertilize, that's just as bad as under fertilizing. So the key is really um, teaching you. Uh, which is something that I've been doing for a long time, which is not to tell you things about you, right? Because I don't know anything about you, okay? But it's to teach you how you can find out things about you and then tell me those things so that I can learn about you and thousands of you, okay? So again, two key points. There is a concept called less is more, okay? Um, and the idea is that for many of you that are dealing with autonomic dysfunction, one of the things that we're seeing is we're seeing a very wide range of vital signs. So we're seeing heart rates that are all over the board. We're seeing blood pressures that are all over the board. Uh, we're seeing oxygen that's all over the board. And when we say all over the board, we've dealt with a lot of patients who are very sick, who have severe heart and lung disease, but there's some consistency 
and some pattern to the way that their autonomic nervous system controls vital signs. And when you have dysautonomia, uh, or I should say dysautonomic function of the autonomic nervous system post COVID, okay, which is what we're calling this, um, there's a lot that's kind of like, you know, up in the air. So it's kind of like you're blindfolded, you're taken to a room, you don't really know what's going on. There's strange sounds, strange smells, strange sights. And we have to figure out what it is. But I can tell you one other important fact, hopefully I'm going to tell you more than one, but there's nothing that is going to solve the problem for all of you. Okay. So in other words, the recipe, look around this board, look at the other people here and understand that if we had a cook off and I said, I want everybody to make a potato salad, everybody would have a different recipe for that potato salad. And so my goal is to try to teach you and help you figure out how do I discover my own recipe for potato salad. So that's an important life lesson anyway. So it's, I always believe that people should be their true selves and find their authentic being. Um, so how do we do this? Okay. Um, first of all, um, I want to talk a little bit about what are some of the symptoms and what can they be caused by and how do we do something about it? So if you have shortness of breath, please raise your hand. Okay. And you can also say if you, if, if you've had it, so if you have or have had dizziness, lightheadedness, vertigo, nausea, vomiting. Some of you are like on Wheel of Fortune. You're like, I got them all. Um, so um, other things, uh, how many people have a, a heart rate that's very variable? Shoots up, comes back down. Blood pressure, very variable. Oxygen, very variable. Okay, got it. So we'll take uh, three minutes for, 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 for questions and comments, really comments from the peanut gallery is the, is the title of this next three minutes. Um, is there anything, what is the most frustrating for you? And what is a, a pattern or a dispattern that you notice when it comes to heart rate? Feel free to unmute yourself and speak it out. I find I do better if I have a lot of protein during the day. If I don't, I, even if my heart rate is normal, it feels like it's fluttering and high. Okay, so you feel like your heart is racing. Yeah. And do you check your rate at that moment? Yes. And is it high? So, no, in the past it used to be very high. I'm on the, I'm starting to level out, but how I feel doesn't always match the number. Okay, great point right there. How I feel doesn't always match the number. Where's that noise coming from? Who's unmuted? Martha, hang on one second. Test, test, okay. So how you feel is not necessarily gonna match the number. Hold on, I'm muting you all. Um, so how you feel is not necessarily going to match the number and the numbers are not necessarily going to match the activity level. Okay. So under normal circumstances with a cardiac patient or even with a pulmonary patient, we can predict that if we increase the workload by 20 or 30%, we expect to see this heart rate change. We expect to see this systolic blood pressure change. That's not the case when you have dysautonomic, when you have autonomic dysfunction of the nervous system and it affects the, the, heart, the cardiac system. So that's two important factors. Um, what about anyone else with heart rate? Seeing any very, all right. So how many people see a higher heart rate than they would expect for the activity? How many people's heart rate shoots up even though it seems like the activity is very little? Okay, anyone's heart rate drop? Julie, okay, and Wendy, okay. So can you tell me a little bit about that? Tell me, um, when does it drop? So my heart rate, there's sort of this weird pattern, although it's not, there's nothing consistent about what I experience these days, but my heart rate will shoot way up, like it'll go up to 160, sometimes even 170. Um, if I, let's say, walk up a flight of stairs, and then when I sit, it will plummet. So it's gone from 160 down to 40. Um, and it's just this weird variability that no one seems to figure out. 
Anyone else have that experience? Okay. So I want to also share some aha moments with you. Okay. So here comes one for you, Julie. Um, you didn't say I get up and I have a glass of water and my heart rate shoots up. You said I, I walk up the stairs, right? How many people have difficulty with the stairs? Okay. So you can have trouble with the stairs if you have post COVID. You could have difficulty if, with the stairs if you have heart disease, respiratory disease, out of shape, overweight, one leg longer than the other. Um, but the idea is that um, the idea is that that's a high level activity. Okay, and that's a great point that I want. Don't worry, Deborah. Your hair looks fine. You look fine. You look beautiful. Just relax, enjoy. Um, so the idea is that, um, Terry, why couldn't we have these numbers when we were dating, when we were young? Look around the room here. Um, but the idea is that um, you have to look at the various activities and we have to understand that each one is going to be like, it's going to throw a stone and it's going to have a, an, a certain impact. Stair climbing is hard for everybody. Okay, you are required during stair climbing to lift yourself up and carry your body up the stairs. Okay, and the less conditioned you are, the um, heavier you are, and I'm not saying you, Julie, um, but, um, and the, the more out of shape you are, the harder it's gonna be. Um, and with COVID, again, even at your, you know, saying what you said, going to 160 or 170, that's a lot, okay? And then why does it plummet? when it's at 40 again. Keep this stuff in mind because this leads right into everything that we're gonna talk about today. So one thing to keep in mind is think about the matching, the matching of the heart rate to the activity or the mismatch of the heart rate to the activity. So sometimes we expect our heart rate to go up, okay? That's normal, okay? Heart rate should rise commensurate linearly with exercise, um, commensurate to the level of exercise. Wendy? <clears throat> Yeah, um, mine happens sitting right here in this chair. It'll fluctuate without doing anything. Stairs are a big deal. I'm not doing them now. But um, I've noticed that my heart rate will jump up and plummet when I bend over to pick something up off the floor. Okay, this time. is great. Okay, this is great. So I want you to, I, this is actually an even better way I can't believe it, but it's even better than what I was thinking. Um, but um, what I'd love to do is I'd love to go through some of these and talk about the physical activity and the physiology behind it. So we talked about Julie, okay? Number one, Julie, stair climbing, very high level of activity. So we would expect a rise, right? But not as much of a rise as Julie's having. She sits and st she stops and sits down. We expect it to come down. We don't expect it to come down to 40, right? I'm going to give explanations for that and I'm going to, theories, not explanations. Um, so Wendy, how many people here have experiences where they're sitting and doing nothing and they'll see their heart rate cycle up to 150 and then cycle back down to 80, 70, okay, 50, okay. Uh, anyone know what normal heart rate is, heart rate range? Let's say the low number, anyone think 40? 50, 60, 60, 65 60, to 80, 60, who said that? 65 to 80, 65 to 80. How much money are you willing to bet on that? 60, <laughs> $60. Normally mine sits around 68 okay. when I'm so just keep in mind that your, just keep in mind that your average is not the standard, right? So one thing that I always say is keep tabs, right? Keep a record of things so that you can track it. And so if I were Julie right now, I would, number one, put some art on that brick wall behind me. And then after that, I would, um, I would think about it and I would say, okay, stair climbing, heart rate went to 170 and then three minutes after stair climbing went to 40. That's information right there. Now, one of the things I've spoken about often is the idea of what does a halter monitor do as compared to an EKG? An EKG is smile, shh, EKG over. Halter monitor is smile, shh, oh, we caught that, we caught that, 
right? And so if, if she had on a monitor at that time, we could say, because a lot of people could have a heart rate of 170 and it could be a different rhythm, okay? So it could be AFib, it could be supraventricular tachycardia, it could be sinus tachycardia, okay? And unless we're actually seeing it, we don't know what it is. Um, and what it is is very important, okay? It's like the 70s, you'd be like, what it is? Very important, I'm bringing that one back, okay? So next, um, we talked about um, sitting and doing nothing. How many people's heart rate cycles up and down when they're sitting and doing nothing? Okay, a good number. So that's a different one, okay? And then we have to think about why that is. The answer to, to most of these questions is I don't know, but I will, I will teach you the physiology. Another thing to, to keep in mind is that, um, you know, when we, when we see things like that, um, some of it's gonna make perfect sense, some of it's not. That doesn't make sense. So the question is, why is that happening? Another point is one I said before, which is that emotional equals physical, right? So another thing is that with, with dysfunction of the autonomic system, okay, we can have a thought and thinking has an impact on our physiology. So if we're thinking about something stressful, raises our heart rate raises our blood pressure, can lower our oxygen saturation if we have a respiratory uh, kind of component of that as well. And this is all mediated by the sympathetic nervous system, right? So we have two divisions of the autonomic nervous system. One is sympathetic, parasympathetic. Sympathetic is fight or flight. It's controlled by adrenaline. Adrenaline. So adrenaline is epinephrine, right? So you know, like in, in Pulp Fiction, where they're like, and they got that's epinephrine, right? So imagine if you're just sitting here doing nothing. Now, if you're dead, okay, you want the epinephrine. You want something in your heart that's gonna sh be like, wow, I'm back. If you're sitting and watching TV, Family Feud is on and Steve Harvey's already exciting enough, you don't want that adrenaline flowing into your system doing nothing, right? Because when you're doing nothing, what does it do? Raises your heart rate, raises your blood pressure, constricts your blood vessels. Does that make sense? So keep in mind that the physical and emotional, okay, yin and yang, okay, they affect each other. There's cycle, physical can affect emotional, emotional can affect physical. And I want to just say it like this, um, you have a dollar, right, in various in, in increments. If you spend 99 of those dollars on the emotional, that leaves you, no, 99 cents on the emotional, that leaves you one cent for the physical, okay? And this is not like that in every condition. This is not like that in heart disease. This is not like that in lung disease. This is not like that in a lot of conditions, okay? It is like that in a lot of conditions and it can be. If you're that person who's really worried and somebody's writing a check in front of you on the checkout line and you're like, that could be you, okay? but I've never seen it to this extent as I have with COVID. So another, another theory is that, um, or another concept is you have a certain amount of expenditures. You can spend it physically, you could spend it emotionally, you could spend it physiologically even, okay? You could be sitting here, your emotional could be causing a physiologic response. Um, what about blood pressures? Anyone have variability in blood pressure? Okay, um, Andrea, may I ask you to speak? Um, sorry, I'm trying to walk the dog as well. Um, so my my blood pressure has actually it's not not variable. It's it's. Um, I gotta tell you, with the mask, I can't tell if it's you or the dog talking. <laughs> it's me, yeah. but I'm walking the dog, okay. and I'm in smoky California. Um, gotcha. But. My blood pressure isn't so variable. It's just running low most of the it's time. It's running low. Okay, what's so low? It's, it's averaging like 85 over 55. So That's low. Okay, that's let me low. go back to heart rate. Heart rate range 60 to 100 is normal. Less than 60 is considered bradycardia. Above 100 is considered tachycardia at rest. Okay, at rest. So now you said 85 over 60. What causes blood pressure to be that low? Okay, that's a question. It could be related to 
autonomic dysfunction, okay? But it, here's the things that I check if somebody's blood pressure is like that. I would ask you, and I would ask you to ask yourself, are you hydrated enough? Do you drink enough water and fluids? Yes, that was the first thing my doctor recommended. Okay, he must be smart. No, I'm kidding. Um, if he, is, is, do you drink, what was your drink of choice? Um, I don't mean alcoholic, I, I mean. <laughs> I'm drinking pretty much um, coconut water and, and regular water. Coconut water and water, okay. Do you think, so here's the thing, a lot of times people say, well, I'm dehydrated, I, I better drink a lot of water, okay? Believe it or not, you could drink too much water, okay? And if you have too so much water. So that I know water, I have. Yep. Yes, I, I've, I, so I've added in electrolytes too, but. Um, Perfect, okay. Yeah, so I so here's the thing, if you're drinking only water, right? If you're drinking only water, then you're gonna have too little salt, you're gonna have too little, you know, electrolytes like sodium, potassium, chlorine, your body's gonna get rid of water, right? So that's gonna lower your pressure. So adding in electrolytes is a plus. Um, are you, when is your blood pressure lowest? Andrea? Um, it's lowest when I'm sleeping. So there's been a few okay. times where I've woken up in the middle of the night and take it and it's gone as low as well, my doctor actually dismisses it as an error in the machine. But it goes as low as what? 60 over what? I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, when I'm in the middle of 60 over 35 is the lowest I've seen. I would say that is probably an error. I, I don't say it's definitely an error, but that's pretty, I think you'd feel terrible. What, how did you feel when that happened? So when it's at its lowest, when I'm sleeping, I feel just really heavy. I don't know how to describe it besides that. I feel heavy. You feel like you're like sunk into the move. bed, like you can't get up. Okay. And then I'm, yes, oh, yeah. Okay. okay, got it. All right, so let's talk about heart rate and blood pressure and the relationship between them, okay? And the relationship to um, dysfunction of the autonomic nervous system. This is very much related to positioning, okay? It's very much related to gravity. Um, it's very much related to the circulatory system and the cardiovascular system and the neurologic system. So those are the things that I want you to, to get to understand after today. And how do we train it? Okay, you can train the autonomic nervous system, but it takes trial and error. It's definitely not the same training for everybody okay but the principles are similar and what i want to teach you at this moment and i'm just going to talk about it first and then we're going to do it or i'm going to do it and you can watch this later and do it along with me as we go along um but going back to less is more and taking baby steps um if you're having how many people are having difficulty right now to, to where you would say you know what, I'm kind of stuck. I don't really see anything getting much better. I see little changes here and there, and then they get worse again. How many people are in that boat? Okay. How many people are uh, steadily improving? Okay, that's good. How many people are in one spot, no variability, just kind of down? All right, so here's the deal, and here's how you're gonna train your system. And, it, and please understand, I'm gonna say it like it's simple. I'm faking, okay? Um, because it's, it's really not simple. It's super complex, and it's, it's really, I mean, it's fascinating. So understand that I'm not gonna give you a recipe right now. I'm gonna tell you the principles of creating a recipe. So let's go from, we're gonna talk about lying down, sitting up, standing, and then activity, okay? And how those are all related. So first and foremost is um, lying, like positional effect of gravity, right? So if we think about that, um, maybe it would be easier for me to show you, just hold on one second.
Can you see me now? Okay. So anything you see happening here, I'm going to deny. So don't try it. So here's the deal. And I'm hearing an echo, so I'm going to shut this up. Can you still hear me now? Okay, perfect. So let's start with... Um, Let's start with the positional effect of gravity. So when you're lying down like this, okay, what's happening is essentially gravity is always gonna point directly down from the sky and it's gonna be pushing or pulling down depending upon which direction or what side of gravity you're on. So when I'm lying like this, essentially there's no impact of gravity on my blood up and down in my body. So in other words, I'm just laying here. It's essentially gravity neutral. The only push of gravity is pushing downward. So if anything, my um, blood is being pushed to my back and my buttocks and the, the back of my legs. So if you think about this position and why people have difficulty with this position, blood is now rushing to the bottoms of my lungs um, and if I were to prone, which is something that's been a big buzzword as far as COVID, um, that would also shift the air aeration, which is called ventilation, and it would shift the blood flow. So ventilation, and here's the impact of, of gravity on ventilation and perfusion. So ventilation means air, and air will always rise. And blood is liquid, and liquid, which is perfusion, is always going to go downward. So when you're in the upright position, air is gonna be at the top of your lungs. The greatest perfusion is going to be at the bottom of your lungs, okay? Just from a principal perspective, if I were to lay down on my left side, well, blood is gonna go down, air is gonna go up, and this is actually the best position to get air to my right lung. So if I had, let's say, a right lower lobe pneumonia, this is the position that I would wanna be in in order to drain mucus from my right lung. It also puts the airways in a position that will allow gravity to bring, bring the mucus down. So essentially here, gravity is just like this. So my blood pressure should be a little bit higher. Okay, well, let's talk about not higher or lower, but what happens to blood here? There's something called venous return. So blood from the legs in this position is flowing back in this direction more so than if I were sitting up or standing up. Does that make sense? So let me start. If I were to right now all of a sudden jump out of bed like this, if you think about what the effect of the blood was at that point, right? Before I was like this, now gravity's pulling down on my blood. And so blood has the potential to go down to my legs and it could go. Now, when I'm sitting, I have two stoppers, right? I have my hips here and my knees here. So this is like gravity is flowing down the hill, but I have these two boulders. So it's like, okay, gravity slowing down. Okay, it slows a little bit here, slows a little bit here. But for many people, especially if you have autonomic dysfunction, that's not nearly enough to slow things down. Now, under normal circumstances, in a normal autonomic nervous system, okay, what would happen is the pressure receptors in my carotid art arteries and my aortic arch, so my carotid sinus and my aortic arch are where pressure is measured, they would send a signal to the brain. Incidentally, those are called baroreceptors or pressure receptors. And the baroreceptor would send a signal to my brain and my brain would say, you know what? We feel like we're losing altitude with the blood. We better bring the blood back up. How do we do that? Squeeze the blood vessels, right? So that's the sympathetic nervous system saying, hey, something's going on here. Send out that adrenaline. That adrenaline causes the blood vessels to constrict. And like a water balloon that I'm squeezing at the bottom, the blood gets worked right up back to my core. And this is called venous return. Is everybody with me so far? All right, don't worry, this is recorded and you can study it for hours later if you like. All right, so now here's the thing. That's a normal autonomic nervous system. So under dysautonomic situations, okay, and there's, you know, people can have different autonomic dysfunctions. So you could have a high 
you know, high pushing outward excitatory autonomic dysfunction. You could have autonomic dysfunction in the other way. But a lot of people also talk about POTS, right? That's a term you hear a lot these days. You hear like POTS-like. And POTS is postural, because postural is important. Orthostatic, which means low blood pressure. Uh, you know, uh, tachycardia syndrome, right? Postural, ortho orthostatic, tachycardia system. That was almost embarrassing if I didn't remember what the O was for, but I was gonna make something up, don't worry. Um, so here's the deal. I'm lying down like this. All of a sudden I feel short of breath. I sit up, my blood drops all the way down. There's no venous return, right? And so imagine I just flushed the toilet and now I'm still trying to flush the toilet, but there's nothing in the tank because it's all on my legs. So does that make sense? And then what happens? My heart says, holy cow, there's two factors in, in, in cardiac output, heart rate and blood pressure. So heart rate times, sorry, heart rate and stroke volume. So um, heart rate times stroke volume. So how many beats per minute? times the, no, the amount that you're pumping with each flush. So it's like, how many times are you flushing? How much water is in each flush? So an increase in heart rate under normal, uh, an increase in heart rate with no change in stroke volume is gonna increase cardiac output. An increase in stroke volume with no change in heart, heart rate is gonna increase cardiac output. If you have a variability, okay, so in other words, my stroke volume diminishes significantly because all the blood is in my legs and there's no venous return. Well, the heart can increase contractility, which means how hard it can pump up to a point. So it's going to do its best by pumping harder, pumping harder, pumping harder. And then it's like May Day. And then all it has is rate. Does that sound familiar? That's the scientific explanation of what you guys are feeling, right? So it makes sense. It doesn't make sense like it's discombobulated, yeah. But at least if we can say, okay, the system's discombobulated, but we can start to think about the physiology and then we can have an impact on the physiology and then hopefully have the physiology you know, change our lives. So that's what we've been doing for 30 years at the pulmonary wellness centers. We're like tinkering and tinkering and tinkering and say, oh, this, oh, let's change it, let's change this, let's change it. And that's what we're trying to do with COVID now. Now, blood pressure, the equation for blood pressure, cardiac output. So I just told you cardiac output is heart rate times stroke volume, right? So now you have that, I'm taking you back to math class. So it's like heart rate times stroke volume in one parenthesis times TPR, which is total peripheral resistance. Peripheral resistance means how much are we squeezing that water balloon, right? So imagine that water balloon, the harder we squeeze it, then we know that the increased pressure inside the balloon. And now I'm gonna give you another theory, okay? This is like physiology 101, um, but here's the other theory, plasma volume, okay? Plasma volume is how much water is in the balloon. So number one, the, sm the, the size of the balloon really doesn't change. It's going to change a little bit through dilation and constriction, but essentially your, your, your balloon system, your circulatory system is what it is. But think about that balloon. So the harder we squeeze, the more total peripheral resistance, the higher the pressure. And also the more fluid in the balloon, the more water in the balloon, the higher the pressure. And that's the relationship with drinking and hydration. So if you have almost no fluid, right? Because you're not drinking any water, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, then you're going to have low pressure. Okay. And if you have no venous return because all your blood is in your legs, then you're going to have low blood pressure. Right. And if you have no constriction because you have dysautonomia and there's a, a sick or I should say dysfunction of the autonomic nervous system, um, I heard a doctor speak, Dr. Dana McCarthy, who spoke on our show last time, said she doesn't like to use the term dysautonomia because she feels it implies chronic. Um, I, can, I can go with autonomic dysfunction. That's totally fine. Um, but here's the deal. So when you are doing these different things, you have to think that, number one, the body is not reading these signals properly, right? So it's like if, if we each have a walkie-talkie and our autonomic nervous system has one walkie-talkie 
and the um, the body and what it's doing is holding the other walkie-talkie. So we could have problems with the autonomic nervous system sending signals. We could have problems with the, the body receiving signals and we could have problems with the body sending signals and we could have problems with the autonomic nervous system receiving si signals, right? So it's like you have a waiter at the, at the at, you know, I could, there was a funny time in Paris where I was speaking half French and it took me like 26 different times to get my order right. But all this is happening at the same time. And it's not happening with any type of consistency and it's not happening with any type of order. And it's very scary and it's very anxiety provoking. And then the impact of anxiety is also, um, Beth, can you please mute? I could, I could hold on. I hear myself talking in, no, it's not me. Okay, so, um, so it's anxiety provoking. And then the impact of anxiety, adrenaline, heart beats faster, blood pressure is supposed to go up. But if we have dysautonomic impact on the lower body, we don't have that constriction. So we have a decrease in total peripheral resistance, decrease in total venous return, and uh, decrease in cardiac output. Does that make sense? I know it's a lot, okay? But what I just told you right there is the crux of everything, okay? I think, I think. Not because I know for sure COVID six months old, but based on my 30 years of this, that's what I think is the crux of everything. So now let's refresh, okay? I'm sitting here. Gravity is bringing blood to the lower half of my body. Under normal circumstances, the under normal circumstances, this carotid sinus is going to be measuring. It's going to be going, okay, 120, 130, 140, 160. Wait. Aortic arch. Aortic is, is going to be going, okay, 120, 140, 130. Okay, look, I better loosen the vessel. I better tighten the vessel. The body likes things to be very consistent, okay? So you can imagine the body hates COVID, okay? The body hates COVID because nothing is consistent. But what we have to do is we have to retrain the body. We have to reopen up the communication between the autonomic nervous system and everything else that's going on. That's how you train it. That's how you rehab it, okay? Part of the problem today is that hardly anybody has been doing this kind of rehab before. Hardly anybody has had to, and hardly anybody is trying to do the rehab under like battlefield conditions where A, there's a ton of acute care patients there where it's life, life and death. Um, the numbers are staggeringly massive. Um, and again, a lot of this is trial and error. So the idea is we have to almost reset. And so if you've been struggling Okay, I'm gonna say we reset. Now that you understand how this works, I want you to start paying attention and ask yourself what's going on. So now I'm sitting here, gravity is pulling down. Blood is going to my lower body, to my buttocks, to my thighs. Under normal circumstances, if my body perceived that there was a decrease in venous return, it would cause a constriction of the blood vessels. If I don't have that constriction of the blood vessels, I need to create that increased venous return in another way. That's why I push compression stocking so much. That's why I push compression leggings so much. And if that doesn't work, that's why I push abdominal binders so much. Because if you think about that water balloon, first we're squeezing the calves, the leggings are squeezing the thighs. And if that doesn't work, then we're squeezing the abdomen, right? And guess what? Now we can maintain a blood pressure. That's why that stuff is so important, okay? Those little simple items like a compression stocking, like a compression legging, like an abdominal binder can completely change your physiology. So now I'm getting ready to go to bed, okay? Let's think about the impact on my body of what happens now. So I'm coming up, okay, number one, I've just eliminated gravity bringing blood to my lower body. I'm now in a gravity reduced position, right? You can imagine that because my legs are now up, the blood is flowing this way towards my core and towards my thorax. And I have an increase in venous return. And that's actually increasing the workload on my heart because now instead of having that distributed through my whole body, it's all right up here. And my left ventricle has to push, okay? 
So if you are having difficulty with any of the things that I'm talking about, then I say start at the beginning. I'd say 90% of the people that I've dealt with so far can deal with a total reset, okay? You could use a total reset because we need some way to just kind of clear the board, to clear the screen, to just start over again with an understanding of how this stuff works. So this is actually a good position if you know that when you get up, Okay, and if you think about it now, blood flow is down, right? If I don't have that squeeze, less venous return, less venous return, less cardiac output, my heart rate has to, so less venous return, less stroke volume. And I told you that cardiac output is based on heart rate times stroke volume. So if stroke volume goes way down, my heart rate has to go way up. And again, it's heart rate and stroke volume working together. It's one or the other, one or the other, one or the other. So if one really, there's a perfect expression now, it's obscene, but I'm not, I'm not going to say it, but it, it would have been like, you get the idea. If one crops the bet, no, if one really drops the ball here, okay, um, like by no venous return, and we have a total decrease in stroke volume, the only thing left is heart rate. And that explains that fast heart rate. Does that make sense? I stand up again, there's an even greater drop. At a certain point, we are not going to be able to maintain cardiac output, and that's what gives us this feeling, okay? Does that make sense? Anyone have any questions so far? All right, so now what do we do about it? How do we train it? If that's you, okay, the best beginning for your workouts is going to be lying down. So in the same way that if you had weak limbs or a weak spine and you exercised in the pool, the pool, the buoyancy of the pool will actually support your workout so that you can, you don't have to be strong enough to stand, to stand in the pool. Okay. So here you don't have to have a strong enough autonomic cardiopulmonary system to still do the exercise. So here gravity is reduced. I have a good supply of blood moving up and down my body, okay? And I want to do the exercises. So I don't want to jump up like Julie and run up the stairs. That's too much. So if you think about what's the minimum amount of way, what's the minimum way I can start to raise my heart rate and start to get my blood pressure going, I can pump my ankles, right? And this is a little bit of exercise. And don't get the idea like, you know, some people might think, well, how is pumping my ankles going to make me stronger? How is pumping my ankle? Just understand, you are not being limited by strength. You are not being limited by a hemodynamic cardiopulmonary limitation or your respiratory system. You're being limited by dysfunction of the autonomic nervous system. And this is training, okay? This is like teaching a child. This is saying, hey, I'm moving my ankles up and down. I'm moving my ankles up and down. I want you to have the impact and make the adjustments so that I can move my ankles up and down and you get it. And you're gonna make, you're not gonna flip, like it's not gonna be like a fly and you try to get it with a hammer. It's gonna be like, let me get the fly swatter. I know how to handle this, okay? So this is ankle pumping and just do it as you sit here. Nobody do it now. Watch this later and do it as it, but, but nice, easy breathing. In through your nose, out gently through your mouth. You could breathe in as, you, as your legs come up or any combination of this, okay? But lying and doing these ankle pumps is more activity than doing nothing, right? So laying here doing nothing, if you're not giving any input to the autonomic nervous system, it's going to make up its own mind. It's going to do whatever it's going to do. And in, 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 the, in the context of, of this dysfunction of the autonomic nervous system, um, it's going to do crazy things. It's going to raise your heart. It's going to cycle your heart. It's going to raise your blood pressure. So let's give it some feedback, ankle pumping, right? And the autonomic nervous system is saying, Hey, I remember that that's ankle pumping. So it's the same way. Like if you just get up and, you know, start running up the stairs, well, your body can't tell the difference between that and getting chased by a bear. So it's going to throw out the entire getting chased by a bear, bear, sympathetic fight or flight, put all the adrenaline into the system, pump the heart, except that the, the whole system is not working together. It's like if you're a trucker 
and the engine wants to go 100 miles per hour, but the, the, the wheels only want to go 50 miles per hour. It's not going to work. I mean, the, the net effect is that the whole system gets messed up. So I would start with this. And if you're somebody who gets up and drops their pressure positionally, well, we would guess kiddo is right behind us outside, if you could see. Um, she just went out for a sunbathe. But you can do this, and you can actually start getting the blood vessels of the calves to constrict. And incidentally, when you're walking, the calves are the main muscle pump back to the heart. So start with this, okay? Next thing you can do. Da, 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 da. And I'm not teaching you like a super complex workout right now. I'm just giving you principles that this is more than this ankle pumps and ankle pumps is more than this so we're trying to send a signal to the body that says ankle pumps level one or, or rather you know lying in bed doing nothing level zero level one ankle pumps level two heel slides level three you can bring your leg up like this and by doing this we hope to get a heart rate response and blood pressure response that is commensurate with the activity you're doing. And by doing that, that actually can prepare you for getting up out of bed. So now getting up out of bed, I can take my legs and throw myself off. And you can imagine that that's gonna shoot everything all the way down, right? Or I can come onto my side to get ready. I can hang one leg off the bed. So hanging one leg off the bed is going to have less of an impact than hanging both legs off the bed. So what I'm showing you now is an actual continuum and I'm showing you a progression. So if you know that every time you sit up on the side of the bed, your pressure plummets, then start with this. Start with, start by lying on your side. This is still gravity eliminated, right? But let one hang, leg hang down because then it's gonna go like this. Like, okay, let me, let me pump that one leg. Okay, let me pump that, that leg up. I'm still stopped here, right? And then I can come up gently and now remember what's going to happen blood is going to go down but the main way that blood returns to the core is ankle pumping right so as soon as you sit up don't let that happen start pumping your ankles a little bit of increased adrenaline a little heart rate increase a little constriction of the blood vessels of the legs and now the body said, oh yeah, I remember this again. We used to do this every day for 50 years. I remember this. I know what I have to do here. Then what's next? Kick your legs out, okay? Because this is more than ankle pumps, right? So you see what's going on here is little by little, we're saying, it's like we're teaching a child to swim. We're going, okay, you can do it a little more, a little more, a little more, a little more. And then we have the cliffhanger or the cliff jumper, which is we have to stand up, right? So here we're controlling it by pumping our ankles. We're controlling it by kicking our legs. And we have these two boulders over here that are kind of stopping it a little bit. And then we get up and whoosh, right? But the idea is you can still do the same thing. Okay, you can get up, ankle pumps. Okay, I'm gonna pump my ankles right now before I, and the other thing you could do what happens when you get up and all of a sudden your blood pressure plummets and you feel like you're going to pass out? What do you do? Sit down, right? That's what most people do. But that's actually the opposite of what you need to do. Now, I'm not advising you to be like, oh, my, wait, let me go towards the glass table. No, that's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is that when you actually get up and get moving again, that calf pump starts pumping the blood back, okay? Now, for some people, you may not be ready for that, but if you were at the pulmonary center, what we would be doing with you is we would be getting you up on the treadmill as quickly as possible, starting the treadmill, okay? Gradually getting you up to a point where you have this nice give and take between the heart and the calves, and that's gonna normalize venous return, okay? So the idea of everything that I'm telling you is that there are reasons why everything is happening. And if you understand those reasons and you understand the basics of how water moves in a water balloon, you can significantly improve your body's response. And little by little by little, the autonomic nervous system is not gonna be, have to be reminded every day. 
it's gonna, oh yeah, I remember that. And then it becomes a part of you. Oh yeah, I remember that. And it becomes a part of you. Oh yeah, and little by little by little, that's how the autonomic nervous system improves. And then the other aspect of it is the emotional response. So I'm gonna just show you one more thing and then I'm gonna go back inside. I'm gonna wrap this up by talking about the emotional aspects of it. Um, and then I'm gonna take questions. But again, just remember, here I am sitting down, okay? Um, and gravity is pulling down. I have two stoppers, okay? If I wanted to, let's say, increase my venous return or increase the return of the blood in my veins back to my core, what's the best thing I could do? Ankle pumps, right? Ankle or, or toe raises, right? Because now what's happening is, just so you know the physiology of that is, when the calves squeeze, okay, arteries don't have any valves. So blood flows through the arteries freely. The, the, the um, veins have valves. So the calves squeeze, the blood moves up like an elevator, floor two. They squeeze again, floor three. Squeeze again, floor four, right? So we could be doing this and this is working it up. Work. Now you may have a dip until your body figures out what's going on, but talk to yourself and say, you know what? I know what to do here. I know as soon as I go from this to this, I'm gonna have a massive shift in blood. So I'm gonna start and I'm gonna pump and I'm gonna breathe. And I'm gonna be like, oh, wait, you know what? I'm actually okay, I'm better than I thought I was. I'm gonna get up, but instead of getting up and standing and just letting gravity pull all of that down to your legs, again, because then we're back in the same situation, except we don't have those boulders, get moving. Okay. And I would say instead, I don't mean like run out to the parking lot. I mean, go into the other room, sit down, land yourself. So imagine you're like a bird trying to fly a baby bird. All right. I'm actually flying. Don't try to fly South for the winter at this moment, go to the tree next door and, and land and reassess stock. Okay. And then you'll be like, Hey, I did it. Hey, that guy was right. He, it actually happened, what he said is gonna happen. And you will build your confidence and you will, it's not just your confidence, you will build the relationship between your body and the autonomic nervous system. And that is what we are doing, okay? Your autonomic nervous system cheated on you, okay? We are trying to reestablish trust at this moment. And I use that strictly metaphorically, not from personal experience. I just wanna clear that, I'm not a cheater never have been never will okay but the idea is that that's how you do it okay and part of the problem and part of the discompobulation of not just within your body is that if two of you get together you go oh my god did you see that lisa can you believe that yeah me too me and then and then you go oh my god a third person and janet did you hear yeah me too and it's like and then put ninety thousand people in the same room and it's like, cha, 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 and there's no order. And it's hard for the medical system, even as a whole, as individuals and as a system to figure out what's going on. You know why? Because as soon as something happens, we become reactive to it. So if you walked up the stairs and you felt that your heart rate went up to 170, where you say, I ain't doing that again, right? Where you say, hey, I went shopping and I nearly passed out when I went to Walmart. And that, that was just related to Walmart. That had nothing to do with my physiology. I went to Walmart, I was like, oh, no, but, um, but the idea is that, um, I'm gonna get sued by Walmart, it's okay. Um, but the idea is that if every time we have an impact and we change and we change and we change and we change and we do something different, you're never gonna learn. Your body's never gonna learn and it's never gonna get better. And you're never going to develop that consistency. And you know, like many of the things I do, I don't have any proof. I just know it's true. It's that simple. So here's the, the homework, and then I'm going to go in the other room, and, and we're going we're gonna, to answer questions. But just think of these principles. So I'm lying down. I want to go. I, I'm sitting up. I want to go to lying down. Just before I give you the answer, think about what's going to happen. So think about what's going to happen. Am I going to have – show me thumbs up, thumbs down. Is my venous return going to increase or decrease? All right, I can't see you too far away, but if you said increase, then you're right. So think about it like this. Increased venous return. Increased venous return means 
that I have more blood going into the heart, which means my stroke volume can actually increase. I can pump more with each stroke because I have a greater supply. And as a result, my heart rate can come down, right? Next order of business. If I were gonna exercise now, go from the little exercise to the big exercise. And don't think of it as like, you know, I am an Olympic skier and here, this guy wants me to just lay here and pump my ankles, okay? Don't think of what is the physical activity. This is a neurologic brain activity in which we are developing trust between our autonomic nervous system and our body. And that's what controls vital signs. So start with this. Start with this. One heel coming up at a time is less work than two heels coming up at a time, right? Sliding it up the bed is less work than bringing it off the bed and coming to here, okay? Um, bringing one up is less than that, okay? Now we've got this Venus return. But this, believe it or not, even though I'm lying down, this still makes you better at the sitting up stuff and the standing stuff and the activity stuff in the same way that exercising your heart on the treadmill will make your heart better in all activities. So there's your workout. You can also do upper body. So upper body is squeezing my hands, okay? That's something. It's more than just sitting and doing nothing. This is more than just squeezing my hands. If I'm, I want, I could do both at the same time. I, I can do this. I can do one arm at a time. I can do this. But the point that I am making is that there is a continuum here. And by understanding the continuum, you can, should be able to not definitely control it, to better control how the autonomic nervous system impacts you. And little by little by little, as you start to get good at the basic stuff, you get good at the medium stuff. And as you get better, but what we can't do is we can't panic. We can't get to the point because I'm seeing kind of a feeling in not just the, the patient community, but in the medical community of like, what are we dealing with here? Is this ever going to end? Okay. Um, it's, it's going to, okay. It's going to get better, but again, it's not going to be fast and it's not going to be smooth. Um, and it's going to take a little while. And the point is though, that we can do things to make it smoother and to make it quicker, or we could do things to keep us exactly in place right now. Okay. Where we are. And by, going bananas by every time something goes wrong, you change your whole routine, right? Well, that's, that's not going to work, right? It's like, if you're trying to train your dog to pee on the wee wee pad, but one day you put it in the bathroom, then you put it in the, you know, the living room, then you put it in the kitchen, dog doesn't know where to look for the wee wee pad. Consistency is the key to retraining the autonomic nervous system. I think that whole thing right there is the crux of everything related to post COVID. I'm going to go in the other room, take a question, but, but again, think right now, stand up, impact of gravity down, blood, lower body, less venous return, right? Less venous return, less stroke volume, less stroke volume, higher heart rate, higher heart rate is now pumping everything down while we have no venous return. Yeah. That's what makes you feel like you're going to faint. So, I'm gonna stand up, I'm gonna start ankle pumps, I'm gonna start doing it, I'm gonna get moving, I'm not gonna go south for the winter, I'm not gonna to go to the supermarket parking lot, I'm gonna to go to the next room, sit down, as soon as I sit, I'm gonna pump my ankles again, I'm gonna kick my knees again, okay? These are things that you can do to train the body to overcome the physiology of what's happening to it at the moment. And by doing that, you're saying to your autonomic nervous system, listen, this has gone on long enough, we need to work together and this is how we do it. I'm gonna take questions.
All right, does that make sense? And what questions do you have? Um, what can I do to compensate bending over and having that drop when I'm bending over to pick something off the floor? Wendy, I just gave you 600 tips. You got to go to the one thing I didn't talk about. No, I'm kidding. Um, all right. So why is that? Okay. So why is that? Why is bending over such an issue for people? Number one, think about it. Increased intra abdominal pressure, increased intra thoracic pressure. Okay. And so when it comes to breathing, this is going to make it harder for you to take a deep breath, but it also sends a signal to the brain. Hey, we got a lot of pressure here we better do something about it. And what it does is it drops your pressure by, by dilating the blood vessels, okay? And by increasing the heart rate, um, or it could decrease the heart rate too, that could, that could be either way, but then blood can pool in your legs. So when you're lying, give me an example of what happens to you. So describe the situation. So I was doing this and this is what happened. Okay, um, sitting in the chair, dropped my phone onto the ground, I stood up to bend over and pick the phone up off the floor and it just plummeted. I okay. could feel it. So um, phone hit the floor. You were like, God damn it. I dropped my phone again. And because I know I've, I've been speaking to you. I, I know you curse a lot, but the thing <laughs> is, so you, so you said this, this is what you said. You said, I stood up to get my phone, right? That was your first mistake. Right? Why? Everything goes down, right? Now, there's no blood returning to the top of the balloon. There's no, it's all in your legs, no venous return. Heart, if, if there's less venous return, there's less stroke volume. There's less stroke volume in the body, only has one way to increase and maintain cardiac output, and that is by increasing the heart rate, right? You increase the heart rate without returning the blood from the calves, because now it's increasing, it's pumping it all out, counting on the calves to support you, counting on the, the sympathetic nervous system to squeeze the um, blood vessels, except we have a dysautonomic, we have an autonomic dysfunction that's not doing that. Does that make sense? So naturally you're gonna get dizzy, right? So you're down here, you're like, oh man. And then you, you give it a little wild card, which is that you, fling yourself down and you significantly increase the pressure. So you go from coast to coast. You went from no pressure to maximum pressure. And then you stood back up again. And it, it's like it's like a ride that is designed to make you sick, right? You're up, you're down, you're high pressure. And you did it. You did it all. So the thing I would say to you is, okay. And, you know, again, I'm not trying to get you to the point where, like, every single thing you're like, oh, Oh yeah, I have to, no, it's not like that. But we, if you want to retrain your, your autonomic nervous system, this is the way you do it. So you have to think, my phone's on the floor, okay? And, and just at the beginning, it's like you don't have to wear training wheels your whole life, but for now, let's put the training wheels on and really get to know this so that it becomes instinctive to us because when it becomes instinctive to you, it's gonna become instinctive to your autonomic nervous system. So you say, you know what? There's that thing. I know if I stand right up, all my blood is going to pool in my legs. Next thing I know, uh, my heart rate's going to increase because there's no venous return. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to trick my I'm going to surprise my body by compressing myself like an accordion. I'll jack the pressure way up so that my body doesn't know what the heck is going on, and then I'll stand up quickly so that it we have zero pressure and all the blood and and your how many times did you bang your head on the on the living room table if the answer is zero then you're very lucky because that's the recipe for passing out right there it's the recipe if i wanted to make a a passing out sandwich that's the recipe right there so it's stand up quickly bend down squeeze release the pressure stand up again drop the blood pass out delicious sandwich you got it? So now, Wendy, let's see if you've learned anything today. So what could you do? Let's say, and again, we're teaching the body, right? We are teaching the autonomic nervous system. So unmute yourself, Wendy. Okay. So had so, you had you had this again, you'd be like, ah, oh, fuck, my phone, I dropped it again. And then what are you going to do? <laughs> <clears throat> 
I'm not going to try to intervene on the cursing. I'm pro cursing. So go ahead. Um, bear down on my core before I bend over. Did you hear anyone say anything about bearing down? Did anyone no. during this whole talk say anything about bearing down? Did no. you hear anybody? How, do, how does blood return from the lower body to the upper body? Moving my ankles and my feet. There you go. Ankle pumps, right? Because that's squeezing. We have valves. Blood goes first floor, second floor, second floor. That's the beginning of it, right? Next, kick the legs out, right? You can just raise the arms up. Like if you do a show, you would be like, da, da. Do it, wait. Let's do it right. Do the phone pickup dance. That's right. And there you go. <laughs> but the idea is that this is science. This is physiology and it's physics and it's gravity. Okay. So the idea is that if you did all that, okay, then that should increase your cardiac output, right? It should increase your venous return. But when cardiac output increases and venous return is like this, guess what we have in terms of blood pressure? Nice and smooth. If we have only increased cardiac output, then blood pressure is going like this because there's no venous return. If we just have venous return, then it's heart rate, it's blood pressure goes up. Very simple. It's math, science, physiology, a little bit of Bugs Bunny thrown in. Um, and, uh, you know, but the truth is that if you guys get to understand this and your body gets to understand this, you're going to get better. And I know there's people out there who are, are, who are doubting this and people are going to go, no, it can't be that simple. If it were that simple, everybody would have thought of this, not him. But we've been doing this for a long time and I'm pretty sure it's going to work. Okay, again, I don't guarantee it, but if that doesn't work, we have other tricks in our bag, right? So let's say you start to pay attention to these things, right? And I want to go get a drink, but I know if I just stand up and walk across the room, I'm going to drop my, my, my blood is going to go to my legs, decrease venous return. I'm going to have an increase in heart rate because I'm getting up and moving. And let's say no matter what you do, you can't control those blood pressure swings, compression stockings, because what do compression stockings do? They squeeze and that's the valve right? That doesn't allow you to hit rock bottom. And if that doesn't work, if squeezing the bottom of the balloon doesn't work, we go to compression leggings and we squeeze the, the, the lower in the middle of the balloon. And if that doesn't work, we do the abdominal binder. And those things are not, you know, it's like a crutch. And people say a crutch is, is like, they use that as a, as a bad thing. Like, well, it's a crutch. I don't think we should. If you have a broken leg, you're going to want a crutch, right? Okay. So the idea is this is temporary. This is temporary. This is for you to use now so that your body doesn't flip out thinking that the shit is about to hit the fan. We better discombobulate in every way possible, right? It's sending the signals. It's a relationship. If only one person in the relationship knows how to communicate, the relationship's going to fail. You need two to tango. Does that make sense? Other questions? Can I, can I ask one from a different angle of it? That is a different angle and a question. You're done. Next. No, go ahead. Go ahead, Kathy. I'm just kidding. Um, I find that, especially like a loud noise will set my heart rate off and I don't plummet. It, I, my problem is, is when my heart rate goes up, it stays up and I have trouble getting it down and it turns into chest tightness. So I don't know if that's... Okay. So I don't say heart rate is going to plummet, right? Because there's two different things. We have to, we have to look at the impact of the whole thing. So heart rate is one part of the equation for cardiac output, right? The other one is stroke volume. So we're talking about blood pressure plummeting, right? Oh, okay. So let's say blood pressure plummets because there's no constriction and there's no venous return. So let's talk about heart rate and what the impact of that was going to, of that's going to be. First of all, if you get scared, okay, if there's a loud noise and we get startled, we have a sympathetic nervous system reaction, right? We have a sympathetic output, so fight or flight. Wait, do I have to run? Wait, is someone attacking me? Do I have to fight? How does the body respond to that? Adrenaline, puts out adrenaline, puts out adrenaline. What does adrenaline do to the heart rate? Raises it. What does adrenaline do to the blood pressure? Normally it will raise it, okay? What is the mechanism by which it raises it? The mechanism is the adrenaline constricts the blood vessels, right? So that's squeezing the balloon, okay? If you're making a face, Julie, because you're saying that, oh, I thought adrenaline 
dilates the blood vessels. It dilates the blood vessels to the working muscles. So if I'm going to fight, it's going to dilate to the arms. Look at that command I have over this whole group. I see even Emma squinting in the back. No, but the idea is like if if that is going to, it's going to it's going to dilate the working muscles. So if I'm going to run. It's going to dilate the uh, the vessels in the leg. If I'm going to fight, it's going to dilate the the vessels in the arms. But everything else is going to constrict. But you see what's happening here is it's when I talked about heart rate and stroke volume, right? We can have an increase in one and a decrease in the other, and then whichever one wins out. So if heart rate wins out and heart rate goes up so much that stroke volume goes down, overall cardiac output is gonna go down. So Kathy, in this situation, startle, right? Adrenaline pumps out, heart rate goes up. Now, if you also have difficulty with constricting blood vessels, right? So let's say I'm standing, let's just put the whole picture together. So I'm standing, blood is already in my legs, right? There's, an, and again, the reason why this is so complex, there's a million different scenarios. Every person's gonna have a different scenario. So loud noise, uh, adrenaline, okay? So under normal circumstances, that adrenaline will, will increase my heart rate, increase cardiac output as cardiac output increases and blood goes to my legs. The autonomic nervous system will sense a drop, carotids and aortic arch, squeeze the legs, normalize blood pressure. So if your question, now I'm ready for the second part of your question or really the first part, but we couldn't do that without this, is are you asking why your heart rate doesn't go down? Or are you, what's, what's your question now that we have that context? Well, I guess, yeah, or how do I get it down? And it's, and I mean, the loud noise can even just be my phone. I mean, I've been keeping my phone on vibrate, but I forget to put my phone vibrate, and it, my phone beeps. And I mean, that will, can, can raise you gotta, me up. You gotta lower the ringer, first of all. Um, no, no, but I, I yeah, know, but it's not No, like, I'm kidding, but, like, the, yeah. but here's the potential scenarios. Here's what it could be, okay? What position are you often in when that happens? Are you usually standing, sitting? Maybe. I mean, I know you can't control when you when you hear a loud yeah. sound, but but here's the potential. Probably lying so you hear, down. Okay, you so you hear a loud sound. Okay, heart rate increases. If you're standing or if you get up, if blood pools in the lower body, that decreases venous return, that decreases stroke volume. Heart rate has to increase, right? So one thing I would suggest is if that were to happen to you, just to retrain the system, you lie down. Okay. Um, so let's say your heart rate is high, number one, because of adrenaline, and then because it has to increase cardiac output, unless you increase venous return, and unless you calm the sympathetic nervous system, it's not going to come down for a while. So I would say just as one, one thing to do, lie down, bring your, your feet onto the bed so that we're stabilizing blood pressure, right? By doing that, now we have a giant bridge up. It's like a dam that's not going to let the blood pool in your lower body. We have good venous return. So the heart says, okay, I have enough blood. I can calm down, start the breathing. And I think that's going to lower your heart rate better. But again, you know, it's, it's unpredictable when something unpredictable happens. But if you're also standing up and you need it to run away, but your autonomic nervous system doesn't know it's supposed to squeeze the balloons, then that's going to lower your cardiac output and drop your blood pressure. And that can make your heart rate go even faster because it's got to accommodate for that. So again, if we just were to get up and start doing the activity, heart rate has, I mean, the heart has two ways of increasing its, its, its ability. So it can increase contractility. So it could pump a little bit harder. Okay. And it can increase heart rate. So under normal circumstances, it does both. But at a certain point, depending upon your heart, then it's left with only heart rate. So what you see is you'll see like, in some people will see like a gradual rise in heart rate because they're able to also increase their um, stroke volume and their contractility. But then once that contractility is done, we only have heart rate. And once that happens, that's like trying to push the toilet to get a flush out of the toilet, but you never give it a chance to fill. Okay, thanks. Other questions? Can you talk about oxygen saturations in the dysautonomia and why there's such a variability with like sitting here doing nothing, I'm getting a lot of variability. How does that tie in? Simple answer, we don't really know. Um, potential answers, 
are, you know, so if you're sitting here and doing nothing, now if you find this talk like super exciting and you're like, I love the material combined with the fact that, you know, you're like, that guy is so good looking and it's like everything is happening at once, that could cause your heart rate, you know, to really drive up. But assuming that's not the case, um, cause that hasn't been the case before, but, um, oxygen saturation should really be stable. So the questions, here's my questions. First of all, are we getting a good reading, right? Maybe yes, maybe no. Yes. And the reason, well, how do you know? Um, it's a good brand. I've well, traded with my mom's pulse ox and hers does great. It's, it's me. It's not the pulse ox. I didn't say it was the pulse ox. I said, are we getting a good reading? Right? There's other things that can affect the reading. So okay. what are some things that can affect the reading? Let's think physiologically. Okay. You're sitting here. Let's say you find this completely boring. You find my looks offensive and you try to avert your eyes, but that doesn't work. So you're sitting here and the entire time you're doing this, what do you think is happening to your blood? Heart rate very, you know, varies a little bit. Um, well, what do you, what, let's go one step at a time. What do you, where do you think is your blood is doing? My blood is pooling to my legs since Could I'm be. sitting. Right, could be pooling to your legs. If blood is pooling to your legs, you know when somebody gets like shocky and they get like pale and cool and diaphoretic, right? Like I'm sure people here have experienced that, right? The reason for that is because the blood is, is, is not perfusing the skin, right? And it's not perfusing the periphery because the, the body, well, there's two things. Number one, the heart is the heart of the body and the brain is the brain, right? And if you ever wonder where those things came from, this is how it is. The brain's controlling everything, and the heart is essentially the, the, the motor, right? So the brain and the heart come up with a plan to escape together. They're like, heart, you better get us out of here, because it's just you and me now. Forget the arms, forget the legs, forget that other stuff. The body will always save life over limb, okay? So if you were to get cut and you're losing blood, your body is going to constrict everything to save the heart and the brain because they're in charge. It's just like government, okay? They're gonna take care of their friends. They don't care about the arms and legs. We're the arms and the legs of this system, right? Doesn't give a shit about us. We could get hacked off, it doesn't matter as long as we redo the Rose Garden, okay? But the idea is that possibly, and this is a possibility, okay? If you're not really, because think about where you get your, your pulse ox from, the very, very tip of the finger. And what has to happen is you get an infrared light that shines from one side to the other. And the other one has to be like, I think I see a light, but I'm not sure. A great, a great, um, and it, it, we haven't been able to do this with anybody, but a great test would be to get a forehead sensor and see if you have the same thing. So my only point is there's a possibility that we're not getting a good reading. Don't worry, you don't have to defend that pulse ox. It's okay, I understand you're very close to it. But the idea is that it could be that we're physiologically getting a poor reading because we're not getting good perfusion, okay? The pulse ox that I use is called the Nonin. It's, it, it's not called the Nonin, it's called the Massimo, okay? But it's, um, it's the most sensitive one in the world. It's for neonates, it's for people who have, you know, very poor perfusion. But even for some people, like people with pulmonary hypertension or people with, um, scleroderma, we still can't get a reading on the hands, we go to the forehead. And sometimes we see a massive, um, now what I would suggest, Amy, is if we wanna test this theory, one way to do it, lie down in bed, let your arm hang over the side, right? Because then blood is gonna go to the arm. Now let's assume it's correct, okay? Let's assume that everything I just said is completely wrong, but you're still fluctuating your oxygen. I don't know what the physiology is behind that. Okay, I really don't know. It could be a mismatch between ventilation and perfusion. Okay, it could mean that, you know, there's blood in the legs, so there's decreased perfusion, but the air is coming in and the oxygen's coming in, but it's just matching up. It has no way to get into the system. So the blood coming by is like the bus. The air going in is like the people on the bus, right? So it's like if you have all these people and, um, you know, there's no room on the bus, well, those people get wasted, right? Those are fares we could have had, but uh, notice I didn't say affairs we could have had because I already told you I don't cheat. But the idea is that, um, you know, you have all these people waiting, but the, the train doors don't open, 
or the bus doors don't open. So we have an increase in, in, in aeration and ventilation, but no perfusion. Now we could have perfusion, which is the buses are coming by, but there's no people to get on. And again, this is a mystery. This is a mystery. I have some clues, but it's a mystery. The part of the reason why I can't figure it out at this moment is because I'm not seeing patients in person. Like if we had you in front of us, I believe we could figure it out using the right equipment. But if anybody is having that experience, I'm happy to walk you through some testing on Zoom and we may be able to figure it out. So that's a long way of saying, I don't know. It's true, but I have some ideas, but I don't, I mean, if I said I had the answer to that, then you know, nobody has the answers. There's two people I know, me and one other person who I think are sort of close to the answers. But other, yep, go ahead, Martha. Do you think that this uh, Venus return and the, uh, all of this that you just described us today, is this, is this a large part of what's causing our fatigue, like the heart having to overwork, the body I having- I think it can be. I think it can. Oh, incidentally, before I answer that, Amy, try stockings, try compression stockings, compression like, because that, if it is a perfusion thing, then that's going to correct that. And also try the, you know, the abdominal binder. So fatigue is a super nonspecific symptom. Okay. It could be the cause of, it could be caused by 26 different things. Could your body being all over the, you know, when like something happens, like you have an emergency and all of a sudden, or like, you know, a tree almost falls on you and you're like, oh my God, and your heart is pumping so fast. And then all of a sudden it ends and you're like, oh God, that was close, right? That could be that, but there's a million other different things that could be causing the fatigue. It could be a, a mismatch in, in resources. Um, it could be, you know, I mean, I wouldn't even want to guess what's causing the fatigue. Yep, Diane. Unmute. When so this coffee is gone, so is the meeting. When this coffee is gone. You I got this really, much time left. <laughs> I'll be quick. I don't really have a problem with fatigue, but I do get exaggerated muscle soreness or fatigue. Could that also be part of this dance? So that's a tough one also because, you know, okay, so I hear a lot of people talk about pain uh, and some of it is pain that is clearly musculoskeletal in nature. So musculoskeletal pain is you did something, the muscles get sore, or you did something, the skeleton got, you know, kind of hurt or bruised up. Um, usually it's palpable, but there is something, you know, and it there may be some degree related to dysautonomia or autonomic dysfunction, but there's also some, something called peripheral neuropathy. And I think there's a neuropathic um, component to this. Uh, I think it's like neuropathy that's not specifically caused by dysautonomia, although it's probably connected in some way. Um, my vision of how COVID works is COVID is like a wildfire that just scorches everything in its path. And it's gonna affect some systems, uh, you know, pro, meaning it's gonna exaggerate some things like maybe pain and neuropathy. It may dull it in, in others. It may, um, you know, and again, it's, first we thought it was respiratory, cardiovascular, neurologic. Um, I just view it as a scorched earth. And my, my technique in evaluation of patients is always gonna go, and it's the same in this, it's the same in this, I always wanna make sure, I wanna clear the heart first, right? I wanna clear the brain second, and I wanna clear the respiratory system third. And the only caveat to that, because it's kind of cardiac also, is a PE, right? And that that's kind of cardiac, but because it, it's cardiovascular, it's related to a clot in the vessels and the pulmonary circulation and it's respiratory. But I always wanna also choose life over limb. And I always want to look at life threats first, which is why when somebody calls, you know, comes in and says, you know, I'm having this pressure in my chest or something like that, I assume it's the heart until it's worked up and proven otherwise, right? Sometimes it's gas, right? But if I assume it's that bean burrito that you had for lunch and then it turns out you had a heart attack, well, I'm going to be in trouble. Um, if I assume you're having a heart attack and I work you up and then we go, oh, 
it, oh, I forgot to tell you, I stopped at a uh, Taco Bell on my way over here and I had three bean burritos, you know, then it's a funny story. It's not funny if we assume it's the burrito and you actually have a heart attack. So in, in that case, I think some of the pain and discomfort that seems musculoskeletal in nature, um, I, I think there's musculoskeletal components to it, but I think there's also like a neuropathy component to this, which is like inflaming, especially because so much of what we know is inflammation based, right? So it's probably inflaming your pain receptors. And so like things that, you know, like it's like when you, um, I used to work in the burn unit at Stony Brook and actually I'm not even gonna tell the story because it's a tough story to hear, but but you know, the, the, the pain receptors are just very tuned up. And so it's right. like, if, if somebody goes, on like your pain receptor, it's gonna feel like somebody's, you know, scorching you. Um, I think that's a big component to this. And again, you know, everybody's got like a mixed bag of symptoms, which is what makes it comp complicated. Um, I mean, as a clinician, it's fascinating to me. I mean, it's, it's for the first time in like 20 years, I'm having to use my brain every day, which I like. Um, I would sacrifice the global pandemic uh, to not to go back to my, you know, mindlessness um but um but i mean it's really complex i think we're gonna get it i think we're getting a handle on it and i think we're gonna so you know just as a thought i mean for something like that there are medications to treat peripheral neuropathy and a simple way to know would be hey doc you know i have this what would you think about me trying this and if you try it and the pain gets better then that proves the theory sort of not in scientific terms, but it's good enough for me. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, there's so many things that, you know, I would like people to try clinically because by the time, no one's doing a randomized control study on, on neuropathy at this moment. There's other priorities, right? So if a, if a medication doesn't really have side effects and you're having this discomfort, you know, that's keeping you up at night or not allowing you to do things, then why not try it? That's my, you know, non, geeky, non-nerd, you know, I'm, I'm scientific, but I just feel like certain things, like we may never have an answer. And if this is not going to hurt you and maybe it can help you, then try it. My opinion. Thank you. That's why so many people hate me, but it's okay. Go ahead, Julie. So as I've been listening to you, um, hang on. <laughs> like sands in the hourglass. So are the days of our lives. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, as I've been listening to you, I like it sparked a memory of, of symptoms that I've had that my doctor basically was kind of like, eh, I don't know, probably nothing. Um, and essentially, it's like it's kind of like it's, I think it's Reynolds, um, where I've had um, like basically almost frozen fingers um, yeah. on one side and. Of course, because I was interested, I took my blood pressure. And at the time, my blood pressure on my, so that it was on my right hand, uh, or right arm, right hand, blood pressure on my left side was about 20 points higher than it was on my right side, which could be a reading. Um, but my doctor didn't think anything of it. But I'm wondering if there was some way in which I wasn't pumping on, like evenly on both sides. It's possible. Um, you know, the thing is that, you know, I told you that emotion and physical are very connected. And um, even like if, if I were to take your blood pressure 10 times in a row, one minute apart, right, left, right, left, there's gonna be some variability. A great way to know the answer to that would be a pulse ox on each finger, right? And then you could see, cause it's happening at the same time. By the time the blood pressure is down and you know, you check it again and your mind is racing and you're saying, oh, I'm gonna get to the bottom of this. You know, I mean, it's, it's hard to know, but if you take one tuna fish sandwich and put it under this arm and another tuna fish sandwich, put it under this arm, one pulse ox on each finger and see if there's a difference. And that's, I actually happen to have two. I can do that. The other yeah. piece of it though, I did. So, you know, the scientist in me um, doesn't believe one reading. So I actually took it five times on each arm. Um, Blood pressure? Even that's going to change the reading. I mean, that's going to change the reading significantly. And it, are you talking about, did, when you went to the doctor and you said it, it's probably nothing, was that before COVID? Oh, or so that was? This is my doctor who still doesn't think I have. Currently. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, 
Um, yeah, because there's a lot of things. I mean, I will tell you this. Every single thing that I do, every evaluation that I do, and every risk stratification that I do, there's pre-COVID and post-COVID. So I don't assume everything I knew for, for the last 49 years, I, I, I go with a totally new slate now, and I assume I know nothing, and I'm learning it all from scratch again. So go ahead, Dawn. Hang on. I got it. I got it. Um, I just, it's, it's um, <clears throat> response to Julie and um, maybe a little observation. I was um, diagnosed with Ray Nods 20 years ago and neuropathy due to a car accident, blah, blah, blah. However, that went away. It was largely um, recovered from that. It was I wasn't having those symptoms. And since COVID, um, it's definitely come back and the neuropathy. And I had a neurological evaluation um, and uh, to rule out anything serious neurologically. However, I am experiencing all those symptoms again with the frozen fingers, the purple fingers, the, the, the pain and the tingling down my hands and my feet. And one last observation, I was improving quite a bit uh, uh, and getting better, especially my heart. Um, and I had a pulmonary function test this week and everything flared up to such a large degree. Um, cardiovascular, pulmon the respiratory, the pain, the um, purple fingers. So, um, and I feel like this inside, even when I do my breath work and my meditation, it's like this. So it really feels like to me, the sympathetic nervous system is in overdrive until I can reset my, my system again. It feels I think those are common. very good. I think those are very good comments. Um, you're, I, you're not the first person. In fact, I've spoken to dozens of people who believe that symptoms of previous injuries or illnesses have come back. And again, that's kind of like my scorched earth theory, which is that like, you know, if you have, you know, like a pipe that burst and you bolster it up and you bolster up, if, if all of a sudden something happens, then, you know, you're going to burst that pipe again or something like that. Um, so there's that. The other thing is that Dawn, you also got some news during that pulmonary function test that also had an emotional reaction and a yes. physical reaction. Again, just keep in mind and just keep talking to yourself, okay? You're in quarantine, so it's easy to do more than usual, but just keep reminding yourself that, um, that um, you know, this is your body getting to know you again, okay? And it's, it's and the emotional, I'm gonna, I haven't written anything recently, uh, I've been busy, but I'm about to write my first kind of paper on COVID and my experience, but just keep talking to yourself, remind yourself, say, you know what, I know what's going on here, don't panic, okay? I haven't seen anybody, like, of all these uncomfortable symptoms, like, I haven't seen anybody have a heart attack who didn't have a heart attack before. Recently, I saw my first patient who did have a heart attack after COVID, but it turns out he had severe coronary disease, had a heart attack previously. But other than that, I haven't seen one person. So I think if you get through that initial kind of flood, as the water starts to recede, um, you know, I think things are gonna get better. Um, I do think that, you know, if you had some stuff in the past, I think this is gonna flare it. I think if you have inflammation in one area of your body, it, it, you know, it's a connected system. But what I don't want is I don't want people to be panicked. I don't want people to think like, this is it, it's never gonna happen. Um, because all that stuff is just a cycle of negative, sympathetic, inflammatory stuff. And you gotta have faith and you gotta, you gotta believe that this is gonna get better. Um, and you know, what I'm about to say, some people may not like the way I say it, but I'm, I'm not minimizing this, but you know what? People get hit by cars or trucks every day. People fall onto the train tracks. People have massive strokes and heart attacks. Um, my dog had a, had a, uh, was paralyzed for three weeks. And these things happen all day, every day, okay? And I'm not saying get over it, okay? That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is, you know what? This is a tough situation. Tough situations happen to people all the time. But we have to collect ourselves Okay, we can't give in to the panic. We can't give in to the chaos. 
uh, because that stuff is all unhealthy for you. And if you believe that the emotional and the physical are extremely tied in, then this cry, I didn't even watch the Democratic Convention because I just, I don't want any of that crap anymore. Like I don't take any, I'm at a point in my life, I don't want any shit from anybody. So it's like, if you post something on my page and it's like, I don't care if it says, oh, well, I, if I post a picture of my dog walking for the first time in three weeks and someone tells me like, oh, I see some atrophy, I'm, I'm booting you because I don't want it. I don't want that negativity in my life and neither do you, okay? Trust me, it's anti-healing. So what we have to do is we have to calm we have to let these flood waters recede while knowing that we're covered by insurance or not, but the flood will recede. Okay. I didn't, I meant how home insurance, but, um, but the idea is, you know, this is life. You're going to get better. Stay calm, breathe it out. There's lots of people working on this and it's going to happen, but it's not going to happen fast. And it's like one of those things where like the harder you try to force it, the less, the, the more likely you're not gonna, you're not gonna get it done. Ali, did you have a question before we go? Hi, thanks, I do. Hey, sure. um, first of all, this last week since I found you has been great. Thank you so much for- A lot of women say that, I hear that all the time, but ah. thank you. I, I'll add your name, no, I'm just- Only gets better, <laughs> right? No, um, I'm joking. Usually it crashes after about four months, so. <laughs> Enjoy it while it lasts. <laughs> All right, I'll enjoy every day. Um, just knowing that there's someone who can help and that I can be proactive and do something to help myself has been great. I guess the concern that I have, my biggest concern right now, you know, I've been sick almost six months and I'm definitely doing tons better, um, but I'm concerned that I might have heart damage or lung damage that I don't know about and I'm not sure um, if, you know, I hear a lot of people are going to see those specialists. It's a lot of money and they're all coming back fine and they're getting frustrated. So what's the, is there a real risk? Would they, would they be able to do something to help? Or is it really just, they might be able to pinpoint exactly a defect or something, but the path is the same doing these exercises. Uh, great the question. System. The answer to all of them is, is we don't know. Okay. okay. Um, my thinking of how it is, is COVID past, COVID present, COVID future. COVID past is, did you have a heart attack? Did you have some kind of insult to your respiratory system that's causing scarring? Did you have a stroke, right? So those are the three systems I told you about. So I worry about the heart, the brain, and the respiratory is third. Respiratory is important, but if your heart and your brain don't work, it doesn't matter how good your lungs are. So did you have a heart attack? Probably not, but you could have. It's not impossible, but you'd know from something like that. Did you have a stroke? Uh, did you have a lung insult that's going to cause fibrosis? Next, is there something active going on? So in other words, are you having something that's putting you at risk for a stroke, putting you at risk for a heart attack, putting you at risk for progressive respiratory disease? And if the answer to that is yes, then something has to be done. Uh, in terms of risk stratification and kind of like a, a thought process on that, I would ask myself in your case, number one, are you having any cardiac symptoms? Okay, that would be chest pain, pressure, squeezing, palpitations, things of that nature, in which case it's easy enough to work up the heart. I mean, the heart, you probably had an EKG, right? I haven't. I haven't seen any cardiac specialist or anything. You have, the even to a regular doctor, you've never had an EKG in six months? So my regular doctor won't see me in the office. So it's virtual calls and he can't detect that. Um, I've been to the rheumatologist. I've been to but GI. But he, he can send you for an EKG. Maybe if I ask him to do that, he would. That, I guess that's what I'm asking. Is it? Are you sure he's a doctor? <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. It was complicated because they didn't think we had COVID here yet. And I presented with COVID symptoms. Uh, and when they did CBC, I came back like transfusion level hemoglobin. And then they said, oh, no, all the problems are that you have no iron. So we just need to fix that. And I really had heart palpitations. Like I felt if, if I hadn't been told I didn't have COVID, I would have been in the ER for sure. But I just waited it out for weeks and weeks. Okay, first of all, that was six months ago. So that was February. I know. We didn't know anything in February. Okay, we didn't know anything in February. That's first yeah. of all. It's now August, we know some things, okay? Yeah. Number one, EKG, that's okay. gonna be normal, okay? Number two, halter monitor 
okay? Right. Which means 24 hours or more, let's see if there's any rhythm disturbances. If that comes back normal and you don't have any other signs or symptoms of cardiac disease, I'm okay with that for now. Now keep yep. in mind, I'm not a doctor. I do play one of these, well, no, I'm just kidding. But, but, um, but the idea is that, you know, I would, if that comes back normal, right? Then we've at least seen you over 24 hours, over 48 hours, over 72 hours. So like, if you get that thing at night, we could say, well, what was going on and correlate it to that. If there's something there, then you can do an echocardiogram because that will talk about the mechanics. So EKG is electrical activity of the heart at that second. Um, it could tell a little bit about mechanics. It could tell a little bit about circulatory. Uh, I doubt you have heart disease, so you're not going to get an angiogram or a cardiac catheterization, but minimum EKG, definitely. Now, if you had a heart attack, which you didn't, that could show up on an EKG, okay? That could, but you didn't, okay? I would bet my left finger on it that you didn't have yeah. an EKG. But the, 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 we could find out if you're having arrhythmias. 24 hour halter and we could find out about the actual structure of your heart and valves which you know a lot of young women do have valve issues particularly with the mitral valve so they could have mitral regurgitation mitral valve prolapse mitral insufficiency and i do believe although again i have no proof um i don't need proof for certain things i have faith and it's worked so far but the idea is that i do believe there are some people who if they had valve issues before or were predisposed to valve issues i think that the inflammation could exacerbate valve issues so i think it's worth looking up if you're concerned about it and trust me your doctor owes you a little bit after six months okay <laughs> he should be he, should, he, he sorry and, and if he called me i would i would smack him with the phone but uh i mean you got to know these things next chest x-ray okay so chest x-ray 90% of the chest x-rays I've heard about clear. So the question is, are you having, you know, respiratory symptoms that could lead to like scarring? Beth, what do you got on TV behind you there? Looks like a, it got, it, um, so, you know, it could be like the things I worry about most with the lungs uh, besides a PE, which I don't consider really a respiratory issue, but is somebody going to have a, 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 a condition like a pulmonary fibrosis, which is scarring. Now you could have scarring for many different reasons, but there's also, there are what we call interstitial lung diseases, which are progressively scarring respiratory diseases, which is super significant if that's the case. We don't know if that's the result of COVID. We don't know if people, we do know there have been some people with pulmonary fibrosis. We don't know, is it that that's going to continue to get worse, but that's a, if that's the case, and it looks like you're having respiratory, simple test, CAT scan, and then you know that. Uh, I mean, if, if we were going to go the neuro route, it would be CAT scan of the head or MRI of the head. But is you, the... you got to get some testing. Six months, you got to know something, because you know what? The longer it goes on, my fear is the longer, is the greater chance you have of having something chronic. Yeah. right because you have this yeah. prolonged inflammation so right. i think it's worth your while to at least do an ekg that one should be on the house um 24-hour halter monitor echo i would start with the heart and then after that if you want to call me or email me we could talk about next steps once you get those results i appreciate that sure. thank you well You know what that sound means. Have a great day, everybody. But I do want to tell you that tonight at seven, it starts with yes. Uh, Lori Nadell, psychologist, Erica Mastrobono, social worker. I will just be sitting in and observing unless they make any mistakes, in which case I'll be correcting them publicly. No, I'm kidding. Um, but um, they're great. And we're going to be talking about the connection between emotions, stress, anxiety, depression, and physical. Have a great Sunday, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you.